What's up YouTube? My name is John Hammond and welcome back to some more Pico CTF 2018. This challenge is called Be Quick or Be Dead 2. It's the sequel to the previous Be Quick or Be Dead challenge. Uh, it's worth 275 points in the reversing category and it only has 537 solves. So that's not a lot and this is now like mid-December so it's been a while since Pico has actually finished um, but a lot of people have still worked on it but it's still not a lot compared to the surrounding challenges. So the challenge prompt here is as you enjoy this music even more, which is again another link to the Iron Maiden song. Uh, another executable Be Quick or Be Dead 2 shows up. Can you run this fast enough? Uh, you can find the executable here on the shell server, but we're given the binary to go ahead and download. So let's go ahead and play with this. I will move over to uh, my directory here. We can W get it. And this is actually the first time that I am like recording on my new computer. I just bought a Dell XPS uh, 15, so hopefully this video won't suck, but I'll be fumbling around on the keyboard. Uh, when we try and run this binary, it gives us a banner, tells us it's calculating the key, and tells us you need a faster machine, bye-bye. So we can't do anything, right? We have no interaction with this binary. Uh, we don't know entirely what it's doing. Maybe if we wanted to, we could L-trace or S-trace some of this stuff. I don't know if that's... yeah, that's... okay. Printing out the banner getting a SIG alarm, so the alarm handlers is occurring. Looks like it's trying to run that function after three seconds. So let's break this down, right? I'm going to open it up in Hopper, which if you don't have it, you can go to hopperapp.com and download a free version. I think the actual pro version or the, the licensed is only $90. I've bought it and it's actually pretty nice. I don't have the license already set up on this in this machine just yet, but let's open it up and control shift O, not just O. Where is the binary? There we go. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you can see all the procedures here, and I've got the main function uh, locked on. And once we jump to it, we can hit Alt and Enter to view kind of a pseudocode decompilation, right? So looks like the main function will display the header, which if I click on here, will display Be Quick or Be Dead 2. Tries to show out those equal signs as a little horizontal line. That's nice. It sets the timer for us. Uh, looks like it has a disclaimer if something goes wrong, but otherwise it will set an alarm for three seconds. And uh, we see an alarm handler function over off to the left here, and that will simply say you need a faster machine, and it will exit. So, looks like after those three seconds are up, we can't do anything. But, if I go back to the main function, after that alarm handler is, is created and set, it moves on. So it tries to run get key. As you, as you can see, right, because it, it told us calculating key, and then it calls this function calculate key. And then once it's completed, it will go ahead and spit out the flag. Looks like it uses decrypt flag as a function, so that key is probably very important. Uh, we will probably need to keep that intact if we are actually modifying or changing up this binary. So let's see how it does that. In the calculate key function, looks like it's calling this thing called fib, with an argument 0x422, so the hex number uh, 422. If I click on fib, reading through this just even superficially, you can kind of assume this looks like the Fibonacci sequence, right? Uh, recursive function with if it's less than 1 or about 0, it'll return itself. Otherwise, keep calling it with variables being subtracted here. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It is past 0x422. If we check out what that number is, and your number might be different, right? In my case, it's 1,058. We need to get the 1,058th number <laughs> in the Fibonacci sequence. And that's going to take a lot of time to calculate. It's certainly not going to happen in less than three seconds. So we've got to try and figure out how we can modify or do something interesting with this binary and, and poke at it. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to showcase an interesting technique that I'm pretty pleased with. Although I cannot take the credit myself, uh, a good friend of mine showed me this, but I think it's a very, very cool technique. So let's create a script for this user bin environment Python. Let's do from pwn import all. Going to be using pwn tools, and that's what I want to showcase here. The pwn tools documentation covers an interesting thing that you can do with binaries, right? If you have an elf object, or you've created kind of just a file or a binary that you're working with within pwn tools, um, you have a function that's really neat called ASM and it will go ahead and assemble a specified instruction set, or the specified instructions, sorry, and insert them into the ELF or the binary at the specified address, address being the first argument, assembly being the second. This modifies the binary in place. I'm assuming that's meant to say in place. The resulting binary can be saved with ELF.save. So that means we can 
essentially modify, change up, and do cool things with the binary. We can patch the binary and patch the program without having to have to deal with it in Hopper or Ida or anything else that may be kind of clunky with the disassembler and GUI stuff. Because I've tried to NOP or like no-op things out or part of the procedure and processes within Hopper, um, and I would save a new executable and stuff like that, but it just would give me a seg fault and it just wouldn't work. So I think this is a really cool procedure and process. So be quick or be dead too. We've got the elf binary that we're working with here. Let's go ahead and run Python ape and be quick or be dead. Gotcha. So the checksec banner runs. Looks like we have partial rel row, no stack canaries, but an X is enabled, so no executing off the stack, and no position independent code. That's fine. We don't care. We're not going to be dealing with that stuff in this video or with this binary or this challenge, but we want to actually take a look at what symbols we have, right? So if you wanted to, you can always check out the symbols that are actually present in a binary. You can just, you have elf.symbols as a dictionary. So let's do for um, key and address in elf.symbols iter tools, or iter items, I'm sorry, we can print out key and then the hex of the address. And if you wanted to, you could literally always get an idea of where things are in your program. So you can look at the procedural linkage table. You can look at the global offset table. You can see some of the functions that it's trying to call or work with, right? You can see get key, you can see decrypt flag, etc., and where they're located in the binary. So we can take advantage of this, right? And we can also just go ahead and patch things with that elf.assembly file to essentially remove that alarm call. Let's say I wanted to have elf.asm, so call this function with elf.symbols at the location of the alarm function, right? And let's say I don't want the alarm function to do anything else anymore. I want to make it useless, render it null and void. So what we can do is we can have the function go ahead and return. So simply do nothing. The instruction for that is just ret, right? And now that that's completed, we've essentially just said, the alarm function's not going to do anything else anymore. <laughs> After those three seconds, doesn't matter. We never even set up the alarm handler. Nothing's going to happen. So we'll go ahead and save this, right? We'll save it as a new binary, just like the documentation said. Now when we run the script, I have a new file, new, over here. And it's the same binary, but if we mark it as executable, go ahead and run it. It's going to try and calculate a key, and it's going to do this however long it takes, because we're not going to get that three-second timeout. But we're still trying to calculate the 1,000th and 58th, or whatever in your case, uh, number in the Fibonacci sequence, right? <laughs> and that's going to take a long time. Certainly, certainly way too long. So let's see if we can patch this binary to also just have that number ready. Let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what that number is. Let's go ahead and Google, right? Let's. I, I've seen actually bigprimes.net, and that's where I actually ended up finding this earlier. Bigprimes.net, if you go there, has an interesting archive of really cool numbers, Mersenne primes, prime numbers, formats, etc., and the Fibonacci archive. So if you were to click on one of these, you can view... Oh, sorry. 1,000 Fibonacci number or whatever. You can view the specific page and specific number for any number in the sequence. So I'm going to change the URL, bring me to 1,058, and you can use whatever you need in your case. Um, and I will try to copy and paste this with my mouse just tweaking out on me. Please. Yeah, whatever, I'll just create a new document and we'll cut it up. So this is the number. This is what we would have eventually calculated, right? Let's go ahead and create a variable for that. Let's just say number equals that. And let's try and patch the binary. So the calculate key function no longer has to roll through all those Fibonacci sequences. It'll just spit out this number. We'll say calculate key will instead, we'll just simply put this value into EAX, right? And let's use percent %s because we're just going to have to submit it in there. And then new line ret, new line. So just instructions here on one line, set EAX equal to our number. We're going to have to add that in as the format specifier and then return. So all it will do is immediately return that number. We will have to format specify it with the percentage here. And we want that number in hex. For one thing, we also need to make it just a 32-bit number or something that will fit in that register. So the way I'm going to do that is actually use the AND sign or ampersand, logical AND, to crank it down to 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So all the way, just that 32-bit just that here. So that will fit in the register. And now that that's 
calculated and done, cool, we've patched that function, and we can save that. Let's go ahead and run the script now. Python ape. Great. So now we still have our new binary here. Let's run it. And just like that, we've got the correct key in place, and it can go ahead and print the flag for us. If we wanted to, we could streamline this. Let's, like, import OS, and then we can probably do os.system chmod plus x new or something. Then we can run new, right, with uh, process dot slash new, and that could be p p dot receive all ideally uh, we might have to wait for it to do things pull out true nope oh the issue is I'm not printing out what I'm receiving that would do it great okay cool so we can actually just get the last line here if we wanted to split that up I think there's a new line at the very end, so we'll have to get the like second index. Cool. And then let's say context.log level equals critical, so we don't get all of that um, nonsense at the very top here. Great. So that means we have a successful get flag script. So we can chmod plus x that, run our get flag script, redirect that to a flag.txt file, and we can go ahead and copy that as well if we wanted to. I don't think I have xclip set up on this new computer. So let's move be quicker be dead 2 to complete, mark that challenge as complete, and let's go ahead and submit the flag. All right. That is the end of the video. I hope that all made sense. I hope it was kind of cool. I think patching like that in Pwn Tools is really, really neat, and I hope that's something that you and others can, I don't know, take on and, and, and do more of because it's super handy in a lot of these reverse engineering and binary exploit exploitation challenges, right? If you can just change what a function does, that's pretty cool. So uh, before I go, I did want to give a quick shout out to the people that support me on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. I cannot say it enough. One dollar a month on Patreon will give you a special shout out just like this at the end of every video. It's nothing special, right? Yeah, you just get your name up in lights. It's cool. Let's give you like a good Samaritan feel good feeling warm and fuzzies in your heart. But I appreciate it. If you want to help a dude put food on the table uh, for making stupid videos on the internet, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. Um, $5 a month will give you early access to everything that I release on YouTube before it goes live. Uh, I've been in a funk and haven't been able to do a whole lot lately, um, but it's just a Google Drive like shared folder that will give you all the videos once I've got stuff recorded. Um, but also just helps me out. If you, if you don't care about getting early content and just want to help buy me coffee, I'm, I'm grateful for that. So... Uh, Please do join our Discord server, link in the description. It's a cool community full of CTA players, programmers, and hackers. Um, we're going to be tackling a lot of capture the flag competitions together, and it's just a cool CTF work camp, hangout place, talk about a lot of programming, a lot of smart people, much smarter than me, uh, so definitely a cool place to hang out. Um, I would love to see you guys in the next video. Please do like, comment, and subscribe, and uh, toodaloo!